a time to die now. You know, I'm normally here in a lecture hall, and you'd be all be 19 to 23. <laughs> now, if you were in law school, and I was there talking law, I'd talk law with this woman here. I'd say, no, man, you've misconstrued it. You've given half of it. You missed a couple cases. And she and I would argue about that and be, be fine. Now, if I was here in ethics, I'd be talking to Ms. Martens here, and I'd say, what do you mean by control? Let's look at this. What control do you have, and, and what control do you think you deserve, and where does it come from? But we're not here to talk ethics, and we're not here to talk law. Since 1970, with the founding of the Euthanasia Society, this thing has been won or lost, put forward on the basis of stories. And we had that great little TV sort of propaganda piece, which was a really nice, it was a good story, wasn't it? It was nicely done. And Ms. Martens here tells a nice story about herself and her life and, you know, her pain, and I'm not, no problem with that. And of course, she tells some other stories, and I'm sure Ms. Fuchs Hill will too. Now, she mentioned Derek Humphrey. And let me tell you a couple stories from the other side. Let me tell you how it looks to the people who, for all sorts of very good reasons, are wholly opposed to this. Now, everybody here know who Derek Humphrey was? Okay, 19, a little bit of history. In 1980, Derek Humphrey and his wife, Ann Wicket Humphrey, founded the Hemlock Society. It was incorporated, actually, August 10th, 1981, but it was founded in 1980. And what distinguished it from end of life, right to die, and everything else was they told a terrific story. They told the story of the death of his first wife from mm -hmm. cancer. And then in 1984, they told the story of the double exit, the peaceful death of Ann Wicket Humphrey's two parents. They were old, they were getting frail, and it was quiet and it was peaceful and it was good. And this story sold a lot and double exit pushed euthanasia and the Hemlock Society way forward on the map. Then they wanted to die in control at a time of their choosing, which is what we're supposed to be about now. A year or so later, Ann, Humphrey, Ann Wicked Humphrey got breast cancer. But she didn't want to die. She wanted to fight the cancer. She wanted the resources of all those nice people who were going to be there at her death side to be there for her life. And as Ann later told Rita Marker in a book called Deadly Compassion, 1993, reported for the New York Times and People magazine, Derek Humphrey, her husband, the head of, a, of the Hemlock Society, was uninterested. He moved out. He left her. Now, he has a story that she was troubled and it was too bad, but he moved out. He left her alone. She and Derek had pushed, so she has a problem here. She's alone with breast cancer, struggling with disease and her husband's abandonment, and also with the knowledge that the book she wrote about her parents' death, Double Exit, was a fiction. Her father wanted to die. He and she pushed her mother into dying with him. She didn't want to die, but she was going to do what her husband and her daughter said, and the tale of a good death was a lie because in the end, the pills weren't quite right. These were amateurs after all. And so in the end, Anne suffocates her mother when she gasps that agonial breath. Now, when death is the only trick you have in your kit, the one-size-fits-all answer to everything, why ever would you expect sympathy or, or help? This is not a one-off case. This is not an unusual story. It's a story that the, uh, the other side don't tell you. About the same time I was involved, getting involved in this stuff, Roswell Gilbert's wife had the very beginnings of Alzheimer's, stage one, fully sentient, aware, a little foggy at times, but so am I. She was the carer in the family. She was the one who did the work. She was the one who took care of everybody. He decided she wouldn't want to live. So he decided it was her time to die. We know this all from the court case, by the way. It's all in the records. He took his gun, put it behind her head, double tap. I think he got off. It was her time to die. Now, I can go on with a lot of them, Janet Atkins, let me just point out with Jack Kevorkian, that serial killing madman's first victim. She was 54, early stage Alzheimer's, stage one. 
10, 15 years, up to stage five, a lot of sentience. Kevorkian thought she would be a great poster girl for his cause. He bought the job, it was very difficult. He didn't know what he was doing. But the 54-year-old Portland, Oregon woman could live with her disease, but her husband, Ron, could not. He said afterwards he hadn't had a good night of sleep in months since she was diagnosed. And so this woman goes to Kevorkian to be the poster girl because her husband couldn't live with her illness. Now, in the mid-1990s, one last case, just to give you, to show you this isn't all history, and this is one I was involved in as a writer and reporter, Jean Brush killed her husband of more than 50 years, Cecil, and supporters of the Right to Die organization, the societies, Ms. Fuchs here, the rest of them, she was the patron saint, she got off. It was a love story, the locals, the Toronto Stars said, 50 years of love, and she killed him because he asked for it. It did not take a great deal of work, about two to three weeks, to point out certain problems with the story. One of them is her husband was in stage five Alzheimer's. It's unlikely that he was making these thoughts and arguing these things cogently. He was just home from respite. The other thing is no matter how much you love your spouse, no how much you hate the suffering, multiple stab wounds in the chest with a bread knife from the kitchen is not an act of love, it's an act of rage. It's an act of anger. It's an act of frustration, it's one which comes from not having the right home care, from not writing, having the right social work, and from being too proud to accept help from someone else. Um, as I said, she was not convicted. I helped get someone else convicted, by the way, in Toronto in 1998, the first time a doctor, but that was another case. So, Euthanasia is about the idea, attractive is foolish, that you're independent and you're, con and you're in control, even if the only thing you can control is your early death. You're, but you're dependent. That's the status of your life, even in health. Others sustain your daily life in a thousand of ways. If you think you're independent, go into the woods wearing nothing but the clothes you have made and the knife you have ground and live for a week, and then you come back and tell me how independent you are. None of you are in control. And the suggestion that we should legalize the murder of people who are sick to enable them to control, you don't control life. Life is what happens. Life is what happens and you react to. Life is what you bring to it. And I think that's what uh, the doctor was saying here. People find in illness. People find when they can't run anymore when they can't see, they find other ways of living because you learn, and it's one of the great benefits, that you don't control. That's the lie we've been sold. That's the bad philosophy you learn in undergraduate school, and that's what this is all about. It's that lie. Now, I do admit you have a right to die. Everybody grants that. Ms. Fuchs here has a right to die. John has a, in fact, you have a duty to die. In fact, call it a mandate. It's in fact an imperative. No matter how many wrinkle creams you use, no how many, how many laps you swim in the pool, no matter how many times you jog, you're gonna die. And you know what? For almost all of you, it's gonna come half a day too soon, half a year too quickly, and half a lifetime before you're ready. And if it doesn't, if you're that one in 1,000, then maybe you'll be that, who finally says, I'm bored with life, well, good luck to you. It's not gonna be dignified. The only good thing about death in my experience, and I've seen my fair share, is that you're too dead to know what's going on to you. When you die, your bladder lets go, your bowels let go, all that blood which is pushing around your face, circulation moving, it stops and pools, and so you get what's called a get, what's it called? A deathly pallor. And then the rest of it comes on down here. All those little microbes who are living in you, they don't die, they go on. Death with dignity, if you believe that, I'll sell you Pat McGear's bridge from the mainland over to the island. That doesn't mean there aren't ways to ease people through the last days, hours, months, and years, there absolutely are, and that's what that woman does. But please don't tell me that you're here for death with dignity. Now, if you still want to die on demand, go ahead.
Put on your war paint, cry out, it's a good day to die. We can't stop you. There's a number of ways to do it. I'll even be glad to tell you some of them. You know, you can wash down a bottle of Tylenol with six belts of scotch and you can turn your liver into a hepatic sieve. That's good. You can run a hose from your SUV right from the exhaust into the cab and you can gas yourself and you'll end up, as one hemlock person said in arguing for this position, you'll end up looking good. You get that cherry look. Uh, you can uh, go and do it while you're listening to the Grateful Dead. Hang yourself, and if you're male, make it an autoerotic adventure. I don't care, we can't stop you. Drive your vehicle into an abutment or off the highway. It's a very favorite fashion. We can't stop you. We stopped legislating against suicides because we were basically legislating against failures. If you succeeded, we couldn't try you. If you failed, you know, you were under charge. That doesn't make sense. But what we do do is we legislate against assisting a suicide because we have what we call the state's life interest. You know, we believe, even if you don't, that your life might be worthwhile. I'm not sure sometimes why we think that, but we do think that. And if you make a failed attempt, if you try and cut your wrist, it's hard to do, by the way, cutting your wrist appropriately. If you take a few pills, we're going to try and help you. We're going to try and give you medication. We're not going to put you on his service, we're going to put you on psychiatric. Because 90% of the time when you have a failed suicide, they're not saying, I want to die. They're saying, I can't make it alone. And we can help you if you let us. But if the only trick you have in your bag is basically the cleaner's bag around your face and too many pills, there's nothing we can do. And your last lot might think, oops, I made a mistake. And that's why we don't allow assisted suicide because it is about killing. It does take us away from the care most people need, and it takes us away. It suggests we know what happens when killing is the answer to life's challenges. You know, I promise you, if you're depressed today, you can die tomorrow. I don't know how many patients, clients I've told that to. We know what happens, though, when killing is the answer. We have a whole lot of history on that point, and it isn't pretty. In Holland, physician-assisted suicide has gone from a movement to secure release from pain in the very last days of end-stage cancer. This was 1984 with the founding of the society. To a general response to everything from, in several cases, anorexia, grief, and early neurology. It's a strange, sad fact that during the Nazi occupation, when more than 50,000 defectives, as they were called, people with MS, people with blindness, people who were deaf, people with Down syndrome, people with a gimp leg, when 50,000 defectives were gassed in Germany, ich klage nach, not one Dutch physician during the whole period of occupation carried out a euthanasia death, but it took at least less than two generations post-war, as Malcolm Muggeridge put it, to transform a war crime into an act of compassion. And that act of compassion is not simply the occasional person who is not getting palliation, it's those people I talked about at the beginning, it's the people who got the pistol in the head. Now, this is really about, not about end of life, this is about your fear of disability by and large. This is about, you see somebody in a wheelchair, you see somebody with a peg tube, you see somebody on a ventilator and you say, my God, I would rather be dead than be like that. Maybe, but you know, probably not. The vast majority of people who accommodate to changes in their physical circumstance find their life in fact improve. And this means people with ALS, MS, AIDS. This means people with spinal cord injury, quadriplegia, and, and, and quadri, what's the other one? Yep. Paraplegia, thank you. Thank you, right. Is that what you ask for out of the world? No. Is it better than dying? Almost always, yes. So, most of this, in the end, is about your fear and not about your right. Now, let me, I'm running out of time here, but let me point out one last thing. 
So you wouldn't want to live like that. Well, you know, five years ago I taught martial arts and cycled, you know, 6,000 kilometers. The real lie here is you say it's my choice. In the end, it's my choice, it's my right, that's what I want. Now that's just bad law, bad ethics, and plain malarkey. Because you can kill yourself, we've already agreed with that. You don't want that though, what you want and what the Hemlockians want is our approval and our assistance and our applause and their help of your dying and their killing as a reflective response. This is about their and your desire for our affirmation material and spiritually because you're afraid that someday you may face a life you'll find difficult. So it isn't about your choice or your desire for us to endorse a choice that is deadly and in almost all cases responsible and we're not gonna do it. We do need to provide more palliative care. We need to make sure everyone in Canada has the right amount of care. But you don't get that by making it easier to kill everybody. In 1991, the World Health Organization said there, the science was there if there was the will and the money to provide care. But you're all here listening to people like Spears in the morning and uh, Ms. Martens here in the evening where are you writing, if you're really concerned, about the need for palliative care in this province and the failure to provide it and the prevailing to find, make sure every physician knows the minimum? Nobody said it was going to be easy. Dying, taking the overdose, that's simple. Oh yeah, one, one last thing uh, as I'm running over here. When I was 16, uh, precocious, I read a book yeah, I have to be. Obnoxious too, you're right. Uh, by Eugene, the letters of Eugene O'Neill, and he said something that I always remembered. Eugene O'Neill wrote, and I read it only once because I couldn't afford the book. I read it in the, in the bookstore, you know, a couple pages a day. I love life, but not because it's beautiful. I'm a better lover than that. I always remembered that, and so I think the real question for you, forget this stuff about the high dignity and the stuff that, Here's your choice. How do you love life? What type of lover do you want to be? And when your lover gets sick, that's when you'll know whether you're Eugene O'Neill's or hers. Thanks. <laughs>